Oh, keluar saya jari infeksinya. Hancur saya di masa depan. Coming to accept that I might never be normal again. Before, I'm so happy I can drive car, I can go out, I enjoy, I got a lot of friends. Now, I lost everything. It's quite long for me already lah, because my husband has admitted about one year. I have a lot of resistance for almost uh, major antibiotic already. Yeah. Maybe about a week postpartum. Uh, I felt pain over my episiotomy wound. After a few days, the pain came back again. <laughs> and my wound broke down for the third time. And at that time, the tissue culture came back as ESL Klebsiella heavy growth. And it was a physically and emotionally painful experience for me. Klebsiella pneumonia same box infection and you can see that the trend actually is getting more to the resistant strain lah. Even though I'm a medical doctor but seeing your son actually in Niku and they had apnea in front of you is a very traumatized incident. Oh, keluar saya jari infeksinya. Hancur saya di masa depan. Coming to accept that I might never be normal again. Before, I'm so happy I can drive car, I can go out, I enjoy, I got a lot of friends. Now, I lost everything. It's quite long for me already lah, because my husband has admitted about one year. I have a lot of resistance for almost uh, major antibiotic already. Yeah. Maybe about a week postpartum. Uh, I felt pain over my episiotomy wound. After a few days, the pain came back again. <laughs> and my wound broke down for the third time. And at that time, the tissue culture came back as ESL Klebsiella heavy growth. And it was a physically and emotionally painful experience for me. Klebsiella pneumonia same box infection and you can see that the trend actually is getting more to the resistant strain lah. Even though I'm a medical doctor but seeing your son actually in Niku and they had apnea in front of you is a very traumatized incident.
cousins can kill and they can save you you are the key life's in your hands so sing with me you you are the key life's in your hands so sing with me hands are such a simple thing but I'm Join your hands and let's be heard. Run 
your hands for you. Rub your hands for, for you. For those you love. For those you love. And patience too. And patience too. All around the world. Let's rub our hands. And let's. Honorable Professor Didier Pitay, Professor of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Geneva, accompanied by our honorable guests. Everyone, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem and the University Malaya anthem.
you. Please be seated. A very good afternoon to our honourable guest, Professor Didier Pitay, Professor of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Geneva. Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Nazira Hasnan, Director of University Malaya Medical Centre. Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Adiba Kamarul Zaman, Senior Consultant of Infectious Diseases, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Honourable Deputy Directors, Professor Dr. Sashila Srila Sri Ponam Palavanar, Head of the Infection Control Department, and to all our guests here today. My name is Anjana and I'm from the Infec Infectious Diseases Unit of University of Malaya Medical Centre. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the clean hands and clean hospitals towards Zero Hospital Acquired Infections Programme. It is indeed an honour for us to be able to host Professor Didier Pite in our hospital. Before we proceed with the agenda for today, let us invoke divine grace and blessings. Let's welcome Ustaz Muhammad Shazni bin Abdullah, Head of UMMC Islamic Affairs Department, to recite a dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful All praise be to Allah Peace and blessing be upon your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His family and his companions Allahumma ya rahman ya rahim We thank you for gathering us, all of us today in this important event may you bestow your guidance and blessing on this event so that we can enjoy and appreciate it significant in our life Allahumma ftah alayna futuhal arifin all praise be to Allah upon your gift of life you have protected us throughout the night and have enabled us to wake up today if it were not because of your love for us we, not, we will not be here today your unconditional love has enabled us to come to this place when we are healthy and ready to start. We pray for your blessing to preserve the event running smoothly and successfully. Bi rahmati ya arhamar rahimin. Allahumma ya sami'u ya alim ya Allah. Please strengthen our commitment to participate together by sharing knowledge and experiences among experts and participants to improvement ourselves in healthy life. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'al marhuma. وَتَفَرَّقْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ تَفَرَّقًا مَعْصُومًا وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِينَا وَلَا مَعْنَى شَقِيًّا وَلَا مَحْرُومًا وَلَا مَتْرُودًا يَا أَكْرَمَ الْأَكْرَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Thank you, Ustaz, for the blissful dua recitation. For everyone's information, our program today can be viewed through the UMMC YouTube channel, and at present, there are 400 viewers online. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my honour and pleasure to once again welcome Professor Didier Pitay to, to UMMC. Professor Pitay is the former hospital epidemiologist and director of the Infection Control Programme and World Health Organisation Collaborating Centre on Patient Safety, University of Geneva Hospitals and Faculty of Medicine, Switzerland. We are honoured to have you here today, Professor, and we look forward to listening to your talks later. Without further ado, I would like to invite the Honourable Professor Dr. Nazira Hasnan, Director, University Malaya Medical Centre, for the welcoming address. Please welcome Professor Dr. Nazira Hasnan.
titled From Clean Hands to Clean Hospitals. of washing your hands. First and foremost, here we work on making alcohol-based hand rubs easily accessible to everyone. Having them at the end of every patient's bed, at the point of care, and also as we enter every ward, act as a, act as a reminder and increases the opportunity for hand washing for every person coming to see the patient, from management staff to the doctors, nurses, medical students, and even the visitors. And this approach highlights that prevention of healthcare associated infection is everyone's responsibility. UMMC is very proud to have had successful hand hygiene campaign yearly and we hope to continue this effort in years to come. In 2019, we had the privilege of having Professor Dr. Pite and his team coming over to our center for the Train the Trainers workshop. And with all these efforts, Alhamdulillah, and with thanks to the cooperation of all parties, we have been able to improve our hand hygiene compliance rates and awareness in our center. This encouraged us to participate in the Asia Pacific Hand Hygiene Excellence Award in 2021. The Hand Hygiene Excellence Award, HHEA, is conceived as a platform to identify, recognize, honor, and celebrate those hospitals and healthcare workers who have contributed to improving patient safety through their excellence, enthusiasm, and innovative methods in hand hygiene. UMMC is indeed very proud, very, very proud to be the winner of the Asia Pacific Hand Hygiene Excellence Award 2021. <laughs> and last year, in 2022, we sent a team and had received the award in Singapore. Before concluding this speech, I would like to congratulate all departments and units directly or indirectly involved in the achievement of UMMC on being winner of the Asia Pacific Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. And most importantly, may this drive us to continue practicing good hand hygiene compliance for the benefit of all our patients. I, as the director of this hospital, of UMMC, pledge to continue making hand hygiene a priority and ensure 
that we undertake sustained efforts towards strengthening UMMC as a clean hospital and a safe hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nazira, for the wonderful speech. I would like to request Prof Nazira to remain on stage for the next event on the agenda. We would like to invite Professor Didier Pite, accompanied by Professor Adiba and Professor Sashila, to come on stage for the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award 2021 Congratulatory Poster Signing Ceremony. For everyone's knowledge, our hospital, University Malay Medical Centre, took part in the Asia-Pacific HHEA 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic and was announced as the laureate of the Asia-Pacific Hand Hygiene Excellence Award 2021 and invited to attend the awarding ceremonies in Singapore last July. I would like to invite Professor Didier to do the signing of the congratulatory poster. Please give a round of applause for the signing of the congratulatory poster. Thank you, Professor Pitay, Prof Nazira, and all our honourable guests. I would now like to invite Professor Nazira to present a, to a token of appreciation to Professor Pitay. Thank you, Prof Nazira. I would like to invite Prof Nazira and our honourable guests to return to their seats and invite Professor Pite to the podium for the next agenda. Today, we are indeed honoured to have Professor Pite deliver us two talks entitled Clean Hands Saves Lives 1994 to 2002 and From Clean Hands to Clean Hospitals. Let us give Professor Pite a warm welcome. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to give you a comment about the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. Because, of course, uh, first of all, it's a big recognition. There are only a few hospitals around the world who could get this award. So the round of applause is for you, above all. And of course, there is no money associated with this award. Uh, the only uh, thing is that we invite you to come and to deliver uh, a message and to explain what you have done to deserve this award. And this is what you did uh, in Singapore. So uh, it was at APSIC meeting. So of course, you couldn't all be there, but uh, it's clear that uh, you were in the heart of uh, Professor Shashila and others who came to Singapore to receive this award. So. Congratulations again, because that's a very important step. It tells a lot. And I can tell you that for me, when you enter into one of those Hand Hygiene Excellence Award hospitals, it's like, uh, it's like very, very, very uh, high for me. Today, I, immediately when I arrived, I saw you wearing uh, T-shirts, clean hands, and so on. So it means a lot. It means a lot to all of us, and is it to tell also how much it is for your patients? Because if we do that, it's for our patients above all. And uh, again, congratulations. I'm so proud of you, and so are uh, your team. Thank you very much. Okay, clean hands, uh, save lives, um, uh, 1994, 2022. I could write 2023 if you like. That didn't change so much over the past months. Uh, and I will try to fly over some of the material because, of course, there are so many things to say that I won't be able to uh, tell everything in, like, 45 minutes. Now, let me watch my... Yeah, make sure that I don't go over time. So I used to start with this image, which is... You know about it. Professor Shashila knows about it. You have been using it, maybe. So it's, welcome to the hospital. Unfortunately, infections 
are waiting for you at the entrance door of the hospital. You are coming to the hospital for something else and unfortunately you may get infected. Now, we speak about it and we usually don't remember the numbers, but the numbers are important. And to give you an idea of the numbers, uh, according to the statistics that are available today, we can say that around the world, every day there is no less than half a million patients getting healthcare associated infections. Half a million every day, right? And here you see in hospitals only, why? Because we don't have the statistics for outside of hospitals infections, but there are infections. There are infections in private practices. There are infections in long-term care facilities. They are not into the half a million patients infected every day. Soon we may have more data. Preliminary data are telling us that this number may be double. So it may be that there, will, there, will, there is maybe at least one million patients getting infected every day in healthcare. So it's a lot, it's a lot. Now to give you an idea of the impact of those infections, I always use the same numbers. Second number is 16 million deaths every year in the world. 16 million deaths. Imagine, uh, I guess you are like 38 million in, in, uh, in Malaysia or something like that. So 16 million. It's almost half of the population, almost, of Malaysia dying every year in the world just because healthcare associated infections. It's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis together killing patients, right? So AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis are among the disease that are known as the very important killers. But healthcare associated infections kill more than these. So the difficulty is that it's a number that is so huge that we have difficulty to see how much it means. Think about it. Almost half of the population of Malaysia dying every day. There are people coming, so come, come. You can come in the front. There is room in the front. Don't hesitate, right? Now, to help giving you an ID, I like to show this video, and I like to show it in silence. So obviously this is a flight crashing. It's a 747 Boeing and everybody on board die, right? Now if you see it on the top, it's written daily impact of hospital infections in the USA. Why did I choose the USA? Because the USA is the country in the world that gives the more money to healthcare. Doesn't mean that the best healthcare system, but at least that's the most money, the country where the most money is going into healthcare. Despite of these, Every day in the USA, there is the equivalent of a 747 crashing and everybody dying on board, which is huge. Despite of the fact that this is huge, nobody speaks about it, right? Because if it would be the case, of course, if it would be a... a, 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 a flight crashing, I won't fly. I would not have flight from Borneo to, to Kuala Lumpur this morning, right? But despite of it, we are still going to the hospital in the United States. We are still going in, in to the hospital in Kuala Lumpur. We are still going to the hospital in my country. And it means that we need to continue to do more to reduce these big numbers. And I'm only talking about the deaths. But as you know, 
for one death there will be 10 more people with you know all sorts of complications there will be massive use of antibiotics and subsequent resistance to antibiotics and so on and so on and so on so the burden associated with this problem is absolutely huge and because of the fact that we used not to speak about it in 1992 I use this and I say healthcare associated infections is a silent pandemic okay it was in 1992 that I say that well nobody knew what was a pandemic right at that time now we know what is a pandemic right we all know what is a pandemic we went to this COVID pandemic and everybody suffered one way or another and a lot of people died by the way COVID killed less than healthcare associated infection right in the world so we think about it it was a silent pandemic nobody spoke about it when I started my career at the University of Geneva as a junior faculty in charge of infection prevention and control the CEO came to me and said I know what is your job but I prefer we don't speak about healthcare associated infection so it was totally taboo we couldn't speak about it I was counting infection and say well I agree you to count but I don't want you to tell <laughs> so you see it's it was taboo now it's less taboo in particular in hospitals like yours where you have I heard 15 infection control nurses right you have infection control physicians they are counting infections we, you have more than 100 uh, linked nurses so everybody is aware of the reality of healthcare associated infection and this is the way to go because if we don't know about it how would you like us to fight against it it is impossible you know if you hide things you don't know about it. you know this for those who have children when they go to school I don't know in your country if this is the case but when when my children used to have bad grades at school they won't tell me right until I discover it you know uh, I know your, your children are mu much better than mine but but this is something you know we we should not hide so importantly for healthcare associated infection it has been hidden for years unfortunately it was the case and fortunately now we we can speak about it but there are countries around the world where you can't speak about it I have friends in Eastern European countries when they count infections infection rates are too high they better not tell about it other than this they will lose their job right so it takes time to enter into this philosophy of knowing about it and that's important and that's important because that's a reality everywhere everywhere in those very modern hospitals everywhere in those very modest hospital or even those more modest hospital in other words there is no hospital there is no country there is no health system in the world that can claim to have solved the issue of healthcare associated infection and this is very very important so by chance we have at least the most important technique that is no recognized as being powerful now this technique used to be hand washing hand washing with soap and water right now the problem is hand washing with soap and water and you are convinced in this hospital because your your director just say that uh, you need to have alcohol based hand rub at the point of patient care at the bedside so not every director of hospital I'm visiting will tell that some people just forget some people are not oriented to that but very importantly in this hospital you know about it. now it used to be hand washing with soap and water but the problem was that compliance was extremely low compliance never went over 40 percent it was around 20 percent between 10 20 percent in most hospitals around the world and um, people were accusing healthcare workers accusing nurses accusing physicians accusing you know and actually that was unfair because what we discovered by our first research 
was one of the main reasons for hand hygiene and washing hands with soap and water was so difficult was time. Because people had no time to clean their hands with soap and water. And that was the reason why this compliance was so low. So this is also why we thought about replacing soap and water hand washing with alcohol-based hand rubbing. Why? Because the time to go to the sink, let's say the sink is there, to turn the water, to have the water on your hands, apply the soap, rinse your hands, dry your hands, and come back to your patient, would take 1 to 1.5 minutes. And a nurse in the ICU would have to do it more than 20 times per hour. So how would you like a nurse to spend almost 30 minutes or more per hour of patient care just to wash hands. It was impossible, just impossible. So don't ask nurses and doctors the impossible. So we thought about using alcohol-based hand rub that is much faster, between 15, 20 seconds, maximum 30 seconds, you can clean your hands. It's much more efficient. It kills bacteria faster than soap and water, even than medicated soap. It's much better for your hands. There is no resistance to alcohol, whereas there is resistance to soap. And it saves water, which is important and will be more and more important everywhere around the world, right? So for all those good reasons, we actually change the system. So we call it system change. We replace soap and water hand washing by alcohol-based hand rubbing. Now, of course, it would not work alone. Here is the alcohol-based hand rub bottle that we imagined and created in Geneva in 1995. Some of you were not born, I suppose. Okay, so we created this, this alcohol-based hand rub and we gave it to everyone in the hospital. So. The, 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 the key question is here, would it work? Do you think it will work? You know, but do you think it works? You just give an alcohol-based hand rub to everyone. Yes or no? Ah. <laughs> no, it won't. I have a friend in the United States who actually, because of what we were doing in Geneva, did it. So he installed alcohol-based hand rub everywhere, but did nothing else. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He didn't change the practice. Now that's important. And let me give you this example that many of you have heard me doing it. What is this? It's a car. It's a car crash. It's in Iran in 2015 and you are on the highway, and you see these. So this is to remind you about the seat belt and the danger to drive your car without a seat belt. So who has a driving license in the room? Raise your hands. Driving license? OK, a lot of people are driving cars, or at least have a driving license. Are you using the seat belt in your car? Please raise your hands. Yes, well, you are very good. You are much better than me. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> Why? Because I'm not that good with uh, fasten your, my seat belt. Let me tell you why. I learned to drive, and I, I went to a car with my father. My father died a few years ago. But the first car of my father had no seat belt. The second car of my father had no seat belt. The third car of my father had seat belt in the front, but no seat belt in the back. And I was in the back as a child, right? So to make a long story short, my father never used the seat belt until he teach me how to drive. Because as a young driver, I was coming in the car, fastening your seat, my seat belt, and my father would come in the car trying to use the seat belt. No. My father was a little old. He had arthrosis. He had belly like this. And 
was very complicated to get the seat belts, so he never used the seat belt, almost. Right. I, I, I became a little better when I teach my, my children. I have four children. I have actually six children, but four who are driver. And, uh, and, and I, of course, I'm, I became a little better using the seat belts. Now, what did it take me to fasten the seat belt? And what did it take us? First, you need seat belt in the car. Yellow sticker. You need seat belts in car. Like my father's first car and second car, no seat belt, no chance to fasten your seat belt, right? Second, you need awareness raising campaigns, like in Iran, to remind you about the seat belt, the use of the seat belt that can save your life, right? Third, you need police control. Huh? And for the more reluctant like me, you need police tickets, right? And this is a combination of things that you need. And you need it, you call it a multimodal behavior change strategy. So it's a strategy with multiple elements that actually will help you to change your behavior. That's why my friend having alcohol everywhere in the hospital failed to promote hand hygiene because he did not understand that you need a multimodal strategy to change behavior. This is actually what we used at the University of Geneva since 1995. We modify education before, after the use of alcohol-based hand rub. Make it very simple to understand by everyone. You don't need any translation. You know that slides are in French and translated in English, but uh, you don't need to translate it in Malay, right? You understand it immediately. You modify education. You actually, I use the walls of the hospital in a technique named the talking walls to use the posters, to have posters on the wall. And today, we have those clean hands posters but it used to be these posters. Posters that were reminding you about the importance of antimicrobial resistance, the use of alcohol-based hand rub. You know, uh, hand rub is the natural killer of cross transmission. Posters that were reminding you uh, uh, about resistance. My son, if they don't get me, you will become multi-resistant. He's telling father MRSA to little son MRSA, right? was a way to speak about resistance to our healthcare workers. And you see dirty staff out of hospital, the way we fight MRSA, and so on and so on. These are workplace reminders. So today, you have these posters that are proposed by WHO, but you can pr prepare your own posters in your institution, right? In your own language, in your own culture, and so on and so on. We'll come back on these later. Progressively, the bacteria became very frightened by our action and moved to Sigmund Freud, telling Dr. Freud, in this hospital, it becomes impossible to cause infections. This hospital is too strong against us. Well, to get all those posters on the wall of the hospital, this is what you call safety culture. It goes with the fact that you recognize infections, that infections are not taboo, that you can count infections in your hospital, that you can go in the ICU any time of the day you want and discover an infection and talk to the staff and say, let's do better next time and let's change what we are doing. This is safety culture. This is your hospital director that is reminding you about hand hygiene, right? Uh, reminding everyone all the time nicely or differently, but this is safety culture. In the same time in Geneva, we sort of monitor hand hygiene. Compliance moved from around 40% to around 66% in, in that period from 1994 to 1997. In yellow, you see hand washing with soap and water. In orange, you see the extra alcohol-based hand rub that is more and more and more used in the hospital. And then we gave feedback 
to the healthcare workers with those data. In auditorium like this one, we were showing the data and explaining that doctors were not as good as nurses, that these persons were better than others, that this department was better than other, benchmarking, giving sort of uh, advice and tools and tricks to improve. So in other words, we implemented a multimodal strategy made of system change, training and education, monitoring performance and feedback, reminders in the workplace, and institutional safety climate around hand hygiene. So important. And of course, when you do institutional safety climate around hand hygiene, it is also around infection prevention and control, right? Hand hygiene is the entrance door of IPC, infection prevention and control. Here is at the University of Geneva the volume of alcohol used in red uh, over time from uh, 1994 to 2016. And you can see that, and you see compliance with hand hygiene also be around 70% in 2016. And you see that in 2009, we used more alcohol than in the rest of the trend of the curve, right? 2001 was H1N1. So it's telling you that we can use more. And if I show you now the curve with the COVID years, we exploded those use. See? So it means that we can do better. We can do better. It's possible. Right? We can use more. Whether it's appropriate or not, it's according to the monitoring of the compliance of the five moments. But importantly, it tells you a lot about human behavior. Because during H1N1, we were afraid. Because during COVID, we were afraid. So we clean our hands more. Right? So it's human nature. It's human nature. We need to work on this. We need to work with that and with this concept. So in Geneva, between 1994 and 1998, we monitored infections, right? And we dropped infection rates by 50%. Not only we dropped infection rates, but of course, we saved lives in Geneva. It's not like, you know, the, the experiment done in Africa, where the rates of infection are very high, that it's easier to drop rates. It's in Geneva, right? So we saved lives, and of course, we saved money. Because when you save infections, when you reduce infections, you save money. You save extra use of antibiotics, and you save money. And for each one Swiss francs, but let's say one dollar, one euro, invested, there was a return of 25. So every time we invest one euro, there was a return of 25, which is good, because then you can say it's cost effective. We, of course, we published it. Then between, we published. We published in the Lancet, and those data are from the Lancet. And between, it was published in 2000. And between 2002 and 2005, there were a lot of hospitals coming to visit us, asking us, how did you do that? Yeah, and we, we gave everything. We tell people, well, try it. And it worked. It worked in different places, in single hospital, in multiple hospitals, in countries where we actually went and helped them to do it. And in 2005, WHO asked us whether we could make this campaign universal. So we had a group of experts. We revisited the guidelines. We wrote guidelines. And we started with these clean care is safer care campaign. Now, remember silent pandemic. To me, that was there. I was very upset about the fact that we couldn't speak openly about infections. It was better in my country. It was better in some countries around the world. But it was not universal. So I thought what we should do, we should mobilize the ministries of health all around the world. And we should ask them to sign a pledge. And the pledge of the Ministry of Health was recognizing three things. A, number one, infection exists. I should not hide them. Number two, there are tools at WHO that you can use. Number three, 
if you use those tools, tell us about the impact of the strategy. And that's what we ask ministries of health to sign. And in 2006, I was here in Kuala Lumpur, and your ministry of health signed the pledge, right? So we started campaign and campaigning all over the world, and here are signatures of the pledge. Handled to myself or to Sir Liam Donaldson, who was the chief medical officer of England, who was um, uh, at WHO at the time, and with whom we run the campaign. Here is uh, photographs in Afghanistan in April 2012, where I was with the Ministry of Health of the time and a photographer, and we signed the pledge. So even in countries in war, we obtained this movement to happen. Uh, at the end of December 2021, we were covering more than 98% of the world population with this campaign, and it's growing and growing and continue to grow. You are very familiar with these guidelines that we developed together with the implementation strategy of clean care is ca safer care, the name of the strategy originally. The strategy is the five mode multimodal strategy that was used at the University of Geneva originally, and then that we transform for use by everyone around the world in healthcare. So, you are very familiar with our tools because you could not be a Hand Hygiene Excellence Award without knowing the five moments, and uh, I know about it. So the five moment tool you know, the five moment tool has been translated in multiple languages. It, ha it has also been adapted. In blue, you see Australia. Australia asked me, we, use, we like the blue. Can we use the blue? I say, fine. No problem with using the blue for the five moments. And then you see Korea, what they did. You see suddenly Playmobil in Argentina, Olaf in Germany, and Hello Kitty in Japan. We are promoting hand hygiene. Now Hello Kitty makes everyone smile, but I can tell you in Japan, Hello Kitty is, is big. It's really something big. So it's big success when you have this Hello Kitty promoting hand hygiene. And it's very important to me because this is adapt to adopt. If you want people to adopt a new strategy, you need to let them adapt. They need to adapt to their resources, to their culture, to their way of thinking, speaking, even thinking. And that's very important. So for those interested, I gave a TED talk on the topic, which is called Adapt to Adopt. This is really to tell you that you need to let people adapt. And it's true at the level of your hospital, level of your country, level of your departments. If the Department of Surgery wants to do this that way, and the Department of Medicine differently, fine provided that they use the same and right concept, that's fine, so you should let them do it. Now, you know the my five moments, you know the how to hand rub, right? The way to do it, you know it, and you will recognize it more and more. But you know the fusion of the concept. Here you are in Turmi, in Ethiopia, in a very remote village, and you are visiting uh, the the clinic that is for fistula repair in, in women. And you see this poster. And you recognize it, right? It's our poster. It has been photocopied. It has been color coded. And it has been translated in the local dialect. The posters that we have made, and this one in particular, have been translated in, in more than 400 languages that we can count, right? There are many places where probably we have not been and nobody sent me a photo to show me the translation. But there are more than 400 translations of these. So that's very, very key because it means that it is understandable. You don't need to uh, speak the language. And here we are. That's my friend Laurent Kaiser, who is an expert in infectious disease, head of infectious disease in Geneva, who is going to Africa to help 
at the time of, COVID, uh, at the time of uh, Ebola, and you see when and how posters on the walls of this very, very, very modest, I can not even speak about the healthcare center. It was an Ebola treatment center. And here is a nurse. Sorry, the video turns. So you see, you are in the middle of nowhere, and this nurse is teaching you how to rub your hands. So this is very key, because this is really what it takes to save lives all over the world. Now the next step is to tell you where we have been with the strategy. Uh, we have been testing the strategy either in some pilot hospitals that we visited before, during, and after we implemented the strategy. We also gave the tools to many hospitals and tell them, use them, and tell us what you think. It helped us to adapt. So you see that we tested it in very modern healthcare settings, in settings with very limited resources, and also in a very multicultural environment. You know that we had some uh, religious issues and discussions at the very beginning with the use of alcohol. In particular, we had to go to the Muslim League after uh, working uh, the, the Quran to know if Muslim healthcare workers could apply alcohol-based hand rub on their hands. And it was, of course, uh, um, obtained, we obtained a fatwa from the Muslim League for the use of alcohol-based hand rub on your hands. I know in Malaysia it, it was never such an issue, but it has been an issue in, in other uh, uh, Muslim countries. And nowadays, you see, it, it was published in Lancet in 2006, and uh, it is frequently used now even in Saudi Arabia without any problem by Muslim healthcare workers. So respecting religious background and cultural diversity was very important. Cultural diversity in India, you can, you can only draw cycle like this. If you do like that, it's not good. So we had to change many posters just because of this. So there are many, many things that you need to adapt. And last but not least, we needed to make sure that we could obtain universal system change. So it means that alcohol-based hand rub, as your director just told you, should be available at every point of care. It's not only at every point of care in your hospital, it's at every point of care around the world. So we needed this alcohol to be cheap. And in this hospital in Bangladesh, where they, they, they are very, it's a very, very poor hospital. You see many patients for one bed, which is very typical of Africa, of some part of India, some part of Bangladesh. Very clearly, they cannot afford alcohol. So what we did is, in the spirit of equity and solidarity, we al actually developed uh, an alcohol-based hand rub formulation that we gave to WHO, and it's patent-free and it can be made available from local resources, like in this case, in Mali, out of sugar can. It's very easy to cut the sugar can, you squeeze the sugar can to produce the sugar with the juice, and with the leftover, you can actually do distillation and prepare alcohol. Then you just add glycerin in a certain proportion and it works. And my friend Lozemi Bengali, the, you, you saw him on this slide, he's a pharmacist in Mali. He came, he came to Geneva, we teach him, and then he went back to Mali, made it uh, in Africa for the very first time in his local pharmacy. Then he went to Kenya and teach these other pharmacists who did it in his hospital, and then it was made for the entire region in the National Research Center. So it works very well. We did the same during Ebola, during Ebola, we went to Africa, and we teach uh, the, the country Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone pharmacists how to produce alcohol-based hand rub to make it available uh, in every hospital. At a larger scale, we do it currently in Uganda, 
uh, in a sugar factory, and I will show you a movie about it, where it's made uh, out of sugar in a large proportion. I will now show you the video. Think about it. Healthcare-associated infections are killing more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis together. We are talking 16 million deaths. So it's clear that this problem is gigantic, and the burden of disease is huge here in Africa, and we can help to solve this issue. Hand hygiene is the main key factor for infection prevention reduction. Now the problem of hand hygiene is that you cannot use soap and water hand washing. So the solution here in Africa, like it is all over the world, is alcohol-based hand rub solution. The alcohol-based hand rub solution should be available at the point of every patient care. The availability at the point of care is the prerequisite for the multimodal strategy for changing the behavior of healthcare practitioners during patient care. Here in Africa, it's a lot more complicated. Transport of alcohol is really a problem. So the only solution, and by far the best solution, is to produce alcohol locally. But there is no plans to produce alcohol-based hand rub. The main reason for our team to uh, visit Uganda was to visit a sugar factory that is linked to the capacity to develop alcohol-based hand rub formulation. Alcohol should be accessible and it should be affordable. And the best expert could produce the top quality standard alcohol-based hand rub that we need. This is to me a dream, and as a reality now in 2018. And in Africa, where access to alcohol is so complicated, this is the solution. So as you understand, with this program, we can, we can really produce alcohol-based hand rub at very, very low cost to make sure that it's distributed all over. So my dream would be to repeat this type of factory in many places, in particular in Africa. In 2014, WHO made uh, alcohol-based hand rub part of the essential medicines list, which means that all the medication that are on that list uh, should be available anywhere, uh, everywhere around the world uh, for healthcare and for any emergency. So it's the equivalent of human right to get this alcohol-based hand rub on this list. Now, the, the next part of the, of the, the, the campaign is to ensure sustainability, and this you know very well about it, because your hospital has been monitoring the hand hygiene excellence, uh, has, has get the hand hygiene excellence award, and you cannot get it if you don't know about the hand hygiene self-assessment framework, which is the system that, scoring system that you can use in order to know if you are in a good way to promote hand hygiene. It has been translated in multiple languages, we have been doing worldwide survey with this tool. So 2011, 2015, we monitor median score worldwide in blue of 300. That raised to almost 400. It's true that we improve hand hygiene promotion all over the world according to the WHO region. And also that in 2019, we repeated the survey. And as you can see, you can see the differences in, uh, in the different element of the strategy, with safety culture being the most difficult to promote all around the world and in most hospitals. So it means that these can improve and we could continue to improve. And uh, when you look at the different uh, regions from around the world, yes, some regions are doing a little better than others, but we can make progress significant all over the world. It means that that's not the end of the campaign. That's not the end of the mission. We continue and 
how do we continue and how do we make sure that more and more hospitals are participating and are succeeding with hand hygiene promotion? Well, for these, we have developed this Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. Uh, you receive the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. What does it mean? It means that you apply for it. It means that because you were among the best, you were visited by two experts and you got the Asia Pacific Hand Hygiene Excellence Award, but we do the same in Europe, we do the same in Latin America, we did the same in Africa, and you were visited, you were judged first by a group of experts for Asia Pacific, I'm leading all group of experts from all around the world, and then you were visited by two experts, uh, <coughs> and the experts visited the hospital, and corrected your scoring if necessary, I talked to you and, and sort of, and then came back to the group of experts and then we decided to allocate to you this Hand Hygiene Excellence Award, which means that you uh, came to Singapore and these are images of uh, uh, one of the meeting in Shanghai where other groups came and received this Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. And the next is a video that shows you what it is in images. It is an award to identify the best hospitals and to provide a platform to learn from the best. You have a scoring system whereby you can score yourself. How good is the institution to promote hand hygiene? And if your score is good enough, you can apply as a candidate for the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. At each of our audit visits, we only spend half a day at the institution. We use the WHO uh, self-assessment framework. To be awarded, you need to have at least three, if not five years of sustained improvement of hand hygiene and decrease in infection rates. More and more hospitals are joining in the program, promoting hand hygiene as a way of life. So as you can see, there are many hospitals around the world who applied, and only a few uh, get honored by the uh, Hand Hygienic Sense Award. But once you got it, you are in charge of mobilizing other hospitals to do the same as you. Because we want excellence to be ideally everywhere so that we are saving more and more lives. The other uh, actions that we have are our Train the Trainers program that we do. Uh, we teach people, the best people in a country, the best people in a region, so that the spread of the program would be, would be important. We did it in many countries from around the world. This is up to 2019, then COVID was there. But the nice part uh, of this is that you see the Train the Trainer program. Once we have run the Train the Trainer program in blue on the top of the image, it spread in the country and this is the bottom part of the image. So the Train the Trainer program is really here to promote hand hygiene widely. We have developed this book that uh, uh, I will not recommend uh, to read at night because you, feel, you will feel asleep very immediately, but it's a good book for professionals in infection prevention and control. Um, there are more than 400 pages on hand hygiene promotion, believe it or not, uh, and uh, that's a book that uh, we will reheat it at some point. Now, adapt to adopt uh, is a concept that we continue to apply. And here is an example of adapt to adopt and work with the community. That's the Turn Africa Orange program that we are running in Africa, where we teach children about hand hygiene. We go to schools uh, and, and we ask them to fill the map of Africa for them to understand that they are part of a of an initiative that is growing and growing and growing. And the children, after they come back from school, will teach their parents about hand hygiene. So Turn Africa Orange will just show you a short video. Turn Africa Orange. Turn Africa Orange. This was one of the most exhilarating experiences we've had in the Turn Africa Orange campaign. I never imagined that schools would take it the way they did. And this 
enthusiasm that was actually oozing out of DDA was very contagious and everybody was so involved with that, including all of us. Well, that's a campaign that we are running with the uh, Infection Control Network of Africa that we developed uh, after the first ICPIC uh, meeting in Geneva. And then from rubbing to dancing, uh, you probably know, you know about it. Uh, you know about this dance, uh, hand hygiene dance that we launched in 2009. You probably know about the story. The n we needed to have an idea about how to launch the first worldwide hand hygiene campaign on the 5th of May. And the nurses in my team say, why don't we create a dance? I say, oh, what a great idea, a hand hygiene dance. So we spent three weeks, my nurses tried to develop a dance, but after three, four weeks, we realized it was easier to teach professional dancers to rub their hands than to teach my nurses to dance. So we obtained a, a, a European champion uh, dancing group. Uh, we teach them, one of my nurses went to work with them, and we did uh, this, this video if you go on YouTube uh, or on Google, you write hand hygiene, WHO dance. We are still number one on YouTube and it has been used many, many times, which is very good. But what is even better is that people took this dance and danced to dance and people adapted the dance. And now there are thousands of dance of hand hygiene on, on YouTube and on, on Google. So, that's the, that, that's the most important to me. It's again the adapt to adapt. So I show you here a very short video. It starts with the professional dancers and then it moves to non-professionals. These are the professionals. These are nurses in my hospital with the CEO. And then we are flying all over the world. This is Hong Kong. This is Papua New Guinea, Canada, Spain, India, Sumatra. I hit to the sink. Canada. So they hit the street. Yeah. Spain, Portugal, USA, Scotland. So this is adapt to adopt. So I will encourage you. Thank you very much. This end up my, my first talk. If you want to follow us, you can use the, the, the different social media, uh, either Didier Pite, Clean Hands, Clean Hospitals. I will address Clean Hospitals a little later. And for, for those interested in the ICPIC meeting, uh, uh, 2023 is an ICPIC year. We have ICPIC every other year, and uh, it's in September. It's September 12 to 15 this year. And let me, it's, it's the largest meeting in infection control in the world. Uh, and that's, we have uh, representative people from more than 100 countries from around the world. So it's very, very international. And the way to come is to submit an abstract and indicate that you need support. Uh, and we can usually support um, almost all abstracts that are accepted in the meeting uh, because of the generous, uh, generosity of our CEO and of our, our university and our uh, sponsors, including Saraya, who allowed this meeting today. So here is the end of my first talk. Uh, we can take questions for a few minutes if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Didier, for such an inspiring and informative talk. I would like to request uh, for Prof. Sashila Srila Sri Ponam Palavanar, Head of Infection Control Department, to facilitate the Q&A session. Um, so if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand. We'll come to you with the mic. Thank you very much, Prof. Pite, for that uh, excellent presentation. Inspiring as usual. 
your years of work and tireless work and, and commitment is, uh, you know, um, and convincing nations to change behavior for the sake of patient safety is, is, is nothing short of amazing. And I think uh, you have inspired a lot of us, at least inspired me, and I think that's why, you know, we joined the Hand, Excel Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. And many people here now know about hand hygiene because of this. So thank you very much. So uh, any questions from the audience? Hi, Prof. My name is Chandrika. I'm from the Department of Biomedical Imaging. Um, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Um, I only have one question to address. Um, it's easy to start anything, but somehow um, towards, as we go, there will be a pl uh, plateau or people will decline. So how do you manage to sustain all these years yeah. of your experience? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. What you are talking about is what experts are calling campaign fatigue. So it's true that in any behavioral change, you reach campaign fatigue at some point. So I had no time to show you what, what uh, was done for these. But it's clear that to have a World Hand Hygiene Day every year with a different theme, different ID, addressing different people, look at those t-shirts that people are wearing, it helps. That's one thing. Uh, we have also developed, uh, uh, either by ourselves or hospitals have developed concepts. For example, we have had these uh, hand hygiene uh, relay where uh, you take as many healthcare workers as possible and they rub their hands according to the technique that we have uh, um, uh, teached. And uh, one of the hospitals that was a hand hygiene excellence hospital in Hong Kong in, the, um, uh, in 2014 had already suffered from this campaign fatigue with an improvement in hand hygiene that was a plat reaching a plateau. So they invented this hand sanitizing relay. They asked the Guinness Book uh, of Record to come and the, the referees were there and the healthcare workers were cleaning their hands in front of the referees, passing the alcohol-based hand rub and they, they won a Guinness Book Record with 166 healthcare workers in a row never failing to use the right technique of alcohol-based hand rubbing. It looks like this, and I say, well, will it change the behavior? It did change the behavior. It improved compliance in the hospital, in fact, for several years. The year after, we did a worldwide uh, proposal to do this type of relay, and the winner, uh, this time with 660 healthcare workers in a line doing hand rubbing, was Mashad in Iran. And then in India, they had 2,500 2, surgeons doing it. And then they asked us whether we could do it differently because it will take too much time. So this hand sanitizing relay has been done. We have uh, had hospitals that did flash mob, so like, and so on and so on. So what I would say is that every hospital should think about it because you are right, campaign fatigue could be a problem. You can uh, do benchmark benchmarking between one sector to another. You can do poster contest. You can do many things. And you know, you sometimes I've seen activities that cost money. Sometimes I've seen activities that cost nothing. And this is lovely. I have seen posters made by children, uh, art, uh, school art working in Germany. The Bauhaus, which is the most fam famous uh, school of art in the world, uh, dedicated one year to hand hygiene and so on. So you can see all sorts of things happening, but you are right, you need to think about it and that's, that's the challenge for the infection control program. Remember that the infection control program people are not the one supposed to have all IDs. You can come with IDs and you know, sort of discuss, debate, and and so on, and, but you are right. In behavioral change, we need to find a way to motivate and to continue to uh, support people who daily, day after day, need to do and practice well in the hospital. Yes. 
Another question. Thanks, as, as always, for that um, inspiring presentation. My, my question is around this behavior change, and, and I think you know, hand hygiene became second nature for everyone, not to mention the the DOS and the you know the doffing and the you know the, the rigmarole for for COVID nineteen. How can we um, how, how can we capitalize on that um, to to sustain this campaign? Because I think the motivation during COVID nineteen was our Afraid. protection, yeah, yeah. whereas all this is is you know I, we already I'm sure we're already seeing people who are not um, doing it as as we should it's because I think the motivation is different. One is we 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 need to do this to protect ourselves largely, whereas you know the rest of the time it's more to protect our patients. Patient. So how can we we turn that? And I think just just from my own experience, you know, I think I um, you know the the not using. Um, needles and syringe and instead moving to um, taking blood with Vacutana was a self-preservation for, 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 for HIV, even not getting needle stick injuries with HIV. And then it became kind of, you know, routine. A routine. Yes. So, so how, how can we do this? Yeah, that's a good point because uh, uh, it's clear that we need to continuously uh, mobilize that. It's true that uh, you have seen, you see that in some hospital, uh, it's a second nature to clean hands. So the downside of it is sometimes people will not clean hands according to the five moments, but who cares? You won't add the five moments to do it. If you do extra, you do extra, it's not so. So I think that the fact of uh, continuously reminding that you do it and that you are a role model for others is probably one way to sustain and to continue doing it. If you have good role models, uh, it helps a lot. And I've seen these because medical students in, in Geneva are supposed to be very good with hand hygiene because it's in the exam. So it's counted in the exam. So they are really, really good. And when medical students from Geneva are going to another university, People recognize them, say, oh, they are very good. But if they go to a department of surgery where the head of surgery is very bad, they lose their habits very quickly. So that's where the role model is so important. So we need to work on that. We need to work on the role model. I think we are lucky that now generations have changed. We have, I have had role models that were sometimes very bad, at, the, at least in hand hygiene they were inexistent, but I mean, now probably the generations are changing, so we need to work and capitalize on this. Be good role model, and the way to transform and, and help role model to be role models is for us a challenge that we need to address. But you're right, we need to find a way to uh, sustain these actions. Thank you, Prof Didier. I think we will continue with okay. your presentation, yeah. and then we'll take more questions later. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Sashila. In the interest of time, we'll move on to the second talk by Prof. Pitay, Clean Hand from Clean Hands to Clean Hospitals. Please give him a warm welcome. Oh, oh you are the one to, okay. Oh, okay. The slides are okay on my computer, but not on the screen. color is not okay but let me take it you always need experts right <laughs> okay thank you very much so from clean hands to clean hospitals uh, sort of a worldwide vision. I will jump over my slides because there are slides you have seen before 
But this is typically on purpose for you to remind uh, what I just said. So I told you the burden of disease, right? No need to repeat it. Half a million patients in hospitals only. Huge burden of disease. Remember, 16 million deaths every year in the world. This campaign, Clean Hands, is probably saving between five and eight million lives every year in the world. Big. Remember what is happening in the US? Car plane, car crash every day. Remember this silent pandemic story, right? We don't want these to remain silent. We want to know about it. Okay. So clean hands. What did we, where did we start? What, what did we do? Where are we today and where do we go? Four questions. I will go very fast over the questions. You will understand what. So where did we start? We started there. Compliance is too low, right? We need to change compliance. The problem is universal. Remember what I told you. No hospital, no country, no healthcare system in the world can claim to have solved the problem. We change the system. We replace soap and water hand washing with alcohol-based hand rubbing. It reduced infections. And we saved money and lives, right? Once we had done that, we published. It was repeated in many different countries. Next step is, what did we do? Now, here is what we did. We reviewed the evidence. We created a multimodal strategy. We developed new guidelines. We field tested the guidelines. We implemented a strategy. We allow for adaptation. We conducted promotion campaigns. We obtained the endorsement of many. We monitored the level. We actually trained the trainers and we drove excellence. And here we are in a hand hygiene excellence award hospital. So this is in some items what we did. Okay, to do that, yes, we developed those guidelines and implementation strategy. You have seen the slide. You, have, you know about the multimodal strategy. You know about the tools that we developed, the five moments that were translated, that were adapted. Remember, blue for Australia. Remember, Playmobil for Argentina. Olaf for Germany. Hello Kitty for Japan. Adapt to adopt, right? So you got everything in, into your mind now. You remember that we tested, field tested, from very modern healthcare settings to settings with very limited resources in a very multicultural environment. And that we even develop an alcohol-based hand rub formulation that could be produced locally at very low cost. So all of this is very fresh into your mind. Now, we did promotion campaigns. How did we do that? What did we do? Remember, we did it at WHO. We mobilized a lot of countries. You remember these. And the next step were to monitor the levels. Remember how we monitor the levels with the hand hygiene self-assessment framework, this tool that we develop, that you use, and that worldwide, we could compare the hospital in between them. Now, where are we today? The last recent 2019 survey, I showed you the results. They were published. You see that we can continue to improve all over the world. And 
you see that every region around the world can improve. So this is where we go. This is where we are. And let's see where we go. You have done part of it because you have been to the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. But we need a lot more hospitals to do the same. And the advice is be the next Hand Hygiene Excellence Award hospital among other activities and initiatives. Now, clean hospitals now. I'm asking exactly the same questions, right? Asking the same questions. Where did we start? What did we do? Where are we today? And where do we go? Okay? Exactly the same questions. Now, what is clean hospitals? Clean Hospitals is, in fact, a coalition, a group, of international stakeholders who actually work together to promote and support healthcare environmental hygiene. So everything that is environmental hygiene in the hospital, so we do research, we do publications, we do participation in conference and events, we educate and train, and we specialize we have specialized working groups. Why? Because healthcare environmental hygiene, clean hospitals is very, very large. It's not only hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is part of it. It's cleaning the floor, making sure the air is okay, the water is okay, the sterilizer is working, and so on, and so on, and so on. Where did we start? We first identified the needs. The healthcare environmental remains a very important gap in IPC. Not many people are working on it. It's not sexy. It's not attractive. It even was not academic until a few years ago. So we need to think about it the same way we did it for hand hygiene. We need to address silos and fragmentations everywhere in the field. Clean Hospitals was officially launched in Interclean 2018, right? You were born, right? That's, that makes the big difference between, between clean hands and clean hospitals, right? It's a lot more recent. Okay, the role of healthcare environmental hygiene in disease transmission is very important, it depends on the setting. We all agree that between 50 and 70% of infections are linked to hands. But we don't know so much about the rest. It's very clear that there is an estimate between 20 and 40% that could be linked to healthcare environmental hygiene. And that's a lot. It's still a lot of infections. Okay? So if we take the, the, the results here for Europe, Currently, one out of every 15 patients will get a healthcare associated infection during their hospital stay. Now, if we are able to reduce 20% more, it will mean one every 19. If we can reduce 40% more, it will mean one every 25, right? So, yes, hand hygiene is very, very important. It's the number one. but there is a lot of infections that we can still prevent by doing clean hospitals initiatives. So this is very important. Now, who clean what? The difference between hand hygiene, where everybody needs to clean hands, right? And clean hospitals, where, you know, people doing endoscope reprocessing is a small niche in the hospital. It's not everybody. I won't teach everybody about endoscope reprocessing. It doesn't matter, right? Whereas I could teach everybody about hand hygiene. So it's a different story. Who is cleaning what? You know, in my hospital, if I go to a ward and I ask who is cleaning these, the nurse would say, it's not me. It's the housekeeping personnel. And the housekeeping personnel would say, it's not me, it's the nurse. At the end of the story, the place will not be cleaned, right? 
So this is a simple example to tell you that this is a lot more complex. So, but we need to work it. We need to make sure that infection control practitioners are talking to the housekeeping department, the way we call it. Sometimes you call it housekeeping, sometimes you call it differently, doesn't matter. They need to speak to each other. Now the good news is that environmental health care is a multimodal strategy. Like hand hygiene, like the prevention of surgical site infection, like the prevention of pneumonia, like the prevention of urinary tract infection. So it's no mystery. It's a multimodal intervention. And the problem is, yet, we don't have the perfect multimodal intervention. But I can tell you, because we revisited it, is that there is a system change. There is training and education. There is monitoring and feedback. There are rem uh, workplace reminders. And there are ease institutional safety climate. That's very important to keep in mind. Five elements in healthcare environmental hygiene. System change, example, access to necessary products and supply. Training and education of staff, environmental staff, managers, raising the awareness of other staff and the CEO. Let me tell you a story. I will tell you about uh, institutional safety culture. Monitoring and feedback of performance, how clean is clean, and optimizing feedback is absolutely key. Workplace reminders, of course, and institutional safety climate. Career development of housekeeping personnel. It's very important. Those people are frequently unrecognized, underpaid. They don't know, they don't speak our language sometimes. Right? So all of these is safety culture. All of these is important. All of these is part of the process. System change, look at these examples. Availability of tools, supplies, and machines. Cleaning and disinfecting surfaces to treat air, air when needed and not always. Uh, to sterilize and reprocess medical devices, water treatment, waste treatment, laundry, and so on. This is system change. And uh, we'll discuss it a little later. Training and education. There are many ways to train and educate people who are in charge of cleaning and disinfection, how things are. You can do classroom, manual training, job training, e-learning, and so on, and so on. Monitoring and feedback. Are you monitoring everywhere where you clean? Certainly not. You cannot. You need to find how to do it. What is the best way of doing it? What is the best way to validate it? Visual monitoring, ATP measurement, microbiological sampling, all of that need to be requalified, need to be reprocessed. Feedback is very important. To feedback to the housekeeping personnel, the way they should and the way they had worked is important. Reminders in the workplace. Here is reminders that we developed with the clean hospital strategy are key. You see, workplace reminders help staff to do the good job, to rem be reminded. It helps everybody. Required safety posters, individual reminders, additional activities and events for raising awareness are important. Where is uh, the process of cleaning? You know, it's different in every, it may be different in every department. You don't clean my office the same way you clean the, op the operating theater, right? When I was a young uh, junior resident, my office was cleaned every day with a disinfectant. It's not useful, right? I prefer the operating theater to be cleaned appropriately and my office to be cleaned only once a week, right? So all of these needs to be integrated in the system, in the hospital. So where is the chief of cleaning? Where are the people working? How are they attributed? How do they share the work between the nursing department and the healthcare environmental staff? These are key. So there are multiple studies that shows 
the importance of multimodal strategy. I have no time to revisit them today, but we recently published a research on these, which is a systematic review. There is an increasing number of intervention in the field of healthcare environmental hygiene that are multimodal in nature. And that's very, very true. Many bundles include five components of, of more of these five elements that I just showed you. So there are strategies, there are components of strategies that need to be put together the same way we did it for hand hygiene to improve sort of interventions how to handle the hospital to make sure it's a clean hospital. And this is very important. So we need to optimize healthcare environmental hygiene. Um, it's as much about the product as it is about the institution and the people. Remember, people are asking me, what, is, what are the best products? Well, there is no best product. There are products that are good for these and other good for that. What is the most important are your people, the people who are cleaning. Because if the people who clean just clean like that, you can have the best product. It won't work, right? So all elements need to work in harmony for improvement, and this is very key. So what did we do so far? Remember, we started in 2018, right? So what we did is we brought together academia and industry to champion the science, best practice, and evidence-based solutions. We actually drove and support academic research. We created a network, uh, really important, where project members can exchange and collaborate between academic institution and industry. Because most of the best research is made by industry in this field and not by academic centers. Uh, we created a platform from which we bring environmental hygiene into the spotlight. We want to make sure people understand. We want to make sure people realize. Here are what we did, our activities in 2021. Sorry, I still don't have the 2022 slide ready, but this is what we did, many different activities, as you can see, including webinars and, and so on and so on. Here are the publications that we did over the past two years. Uh, many of the publications, first author is Alexandra Peters, who is actually, this is the second page of publication, who is actually our lead uh, scientist for the Clean Hospitals project. We have this Clean Hospitals Day, which is the same way we have the 5th of May, we have the 20th of October, which is every uh, year we will celebrate uh, the 5th of May. Here is in what we did in 2020, in 2021, Clean Hospitals Day in uh, 2022 was, of course, on the 20th of October, as it is every year. Um, where are we today, and where, uh, what do we see? Uh, we are continuing our research and academic work. We are expanding our network and connecting with industry. We are actually uh, finding new ways to champion uh, healthcare environmental hygiene and patient safety, which is very key. Now, importantly, as John Harter said, you should never lose the opportunity of an epidemic or of a pandemic, right? Uh, that's very important. So we had, you have seen, as you said earlier, that during, during COVID, everybody was sort of sensitized and start rubbing hands in the supermarket. So we need to continue over that. The story about this is, like one of my friends in the United States was asking for the money for a robot to clean. And during seven years, he was asking every year for the robot. Never got the money. This year, he got the money to buy seven robots. So it's telling a lot about the fact that you should continue to sort of, uh, uh, sort of take the opportunity that was offered to, to us. For those interested, the impact of environmental hygiene intervention on healthcare associated uh, uh, infection and colonization, we conducted a systematic review of all the studies that are published in this field. 
you can access it's published in ARIC. And the good news is that, yes, definitively, intervention exists. Here is the main conclusion of the study, actually, that we published. The healthcare environmental hygiene is important for patient safety, definitively. By having interventions that work, you reduce healthcare associated infection, you reduce patient colonization, you reduce bio burden. But we need more and better studies designed to measure colonization and infection in the field. So we also conducted a study uh, uh, of uh, a pilot survey to see what was the problem worldwide. And the main result is this, of this pilot survey. 98% of healthcare facilities were ma majorly lacking uh, of at least one of the components of the multimodal strategy. So it's important to realize that nobody is perfect. No healthcare institution in the world can claim to be right in environmental healthcare. So it's give us the momentum to create what we have created as a hand hygiene self-assessment framework. We are creating the healthcare environmental hygiene self-assessment framework currently. And we are developing the tool, and this is the Gantt chart of the development of the tool. So you may be invited to test and validate the tool very soon, right? We are developing these. We are, uh, uh, where do we go? We will continue to develop this research. We will continue to develop this self-assessment framework. The same way we had this hand hygiene self-assessment framework, we have this healthcare environmental self-assessment framework. We will have every year a clean care, a clean hospitals, conference on the 20th of October, and we are currently preparing our program for next year. Steps to take care for the future. How can we do better? It's listed here. We will continue to improve. We'll continue to do our work and uh, include relevant stakeholders globally. Keep the momentum post-pandemic. For those interested, this is the Celebrating Clean Hospitals Day, as you can see, uh, that we'll have every year on the 20th of October. Uh, we, it was in Geneva in 2022. Uh, we don't know where it will be next, uh, next year. It will be uh, announced soon at ICPIC. The future of healthcare and environmental hygiene must be flexible, agile, based on best practices, and need to include all type of healthcare facilities, must take into account logistics, production, and so on, and so on. Needs to include having plans placed for emergency situations. And this is very, very, very key. So, uh, where did we, uh, where did we uh, start? What did we do? Uh, where are we today? Where are we going? Now, it's important for you to think about these. And uh, uh, I, I will come back in a minute, read these, and think about it. I will give you the answer later. Looking for toilet. Yeah, I don't, I don't too much. I don't too much, but I need to go to
Okay, thank you. Sorry. So now I let you think about this. Clean Hospital showed the way to go from 1995. So 1995 is a long time ago. Reviewing the evidence and building intervention strategy was absolutely critical. So this is what we did from the beginning for Clean Hands, right? Clean Hands is in orange. Now, monitoring performance, progress, and time trends was really the way we ensured sustainability and improvement in the Clean Hands program, right? So if you think about it, how would you imagine the Clean Hospitals program to run? Very easy. Clean Hospital was launched only in 2018. So it's very new. It's a baby as to compare to Clean Hands. And the model is exactly framed on the Clean Hands model. So we, we modeled it on the Clean Hands model. So if you think about now what you have seen, monitoring the burden, the importance, the, the tools that we develop. Now what is the most important is to review the evidence. We are doing it all the time. We have published this systematic review. We encourage others to do good studies, okay? We developed strategies, so we are currently developing strategies, clearly, uh, based on the evidence that we have up to today and the evidence that others will provide. We are monitoring practices. So now how would you monitor practices? That's why we developed the healthcare environmental hygiene self-assessment framework. We need to monitor what's going on all over the world. We need to monitor what's going on in your hospital, in my hospital, in next door hospital, it's in a country, and then we'll have data from all around the world. And we need to ensure sustainability. So to ensure sustainability, we need to develop tools that we validate, we apply, we share, and we adapt. Same way we did for clean hands. So I would like to conclude by thanking uh, the companies that are already on board for clean hospitals. These companies are uh, endorsing the program and they are working the same way we did for hand hygiene at the beginning. We meet with these people regularly and we develop research and science with a group of experts that are uh, like the group of experts we had originally for the Clean Hands program. And it's exactly the same concept that we are developing. So I guess it's very clear for, for you what we are doing. And that's why it was so important for me to remind you about the Clean Hands and the way we translate the Clean Hands model into the clean hospitals. Thank you for your attention. We'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor Didier. If there are any questions, any burning questions, please raise your hand and we will come to you with the mic. Any question, welcome. Oh, we actually have a question from YouTube. Um, okay, the question is from um, Puan Haslina from the National Heart Center of Malaysia. Um, she was asking about the difference in effectiveness of the foam hand disinfectant compared to the water or gel-based hand rub. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's a question about hand hygiene, but it's hand hygiene is, is part of clean hospitals too. So there is no problem. So um, there are differences. There are differences, but the problem is when you discuss between rinses and gels, there are, it's not rinse on one side, gels on the other side. It's, it's a continuum between a rinse and a gel. 
Now, what is the most important is like, for example, in Europe, we have European standards. So a product cannot be on the market if the product doesn't meet the European standards. There are the US standards that are less stringent. I don't think that in Asia you have universal standards, but most of your product actually in your hospital, for example, are meeting the European standards. And so it's very clear that a product should meet the microbiological standards. And this is the case for most of the products that are sold by, that are sold by the best companies, That's obviously because uh, the, the bad product don't survive the market. Now, foams, uh, so between rinses and gels, the more the gels are jelly, the more difficult it is to ma make a gel very efficient or as efficient as recommended. So if you are exposed to two jelly gels, you have to be careful and make sure that they meet the standards. Now, uh, if you think about foams, foam is a difficult issue because there are foams on the market that were never tested against the rinses or against the gels. So uh, that's why, so far, we are still lacking good science. There are good science in the laboratory that has been provided but so far, there is not good science on the clinical work. So there is, to my knowledge, yet no study with a foam that confirmed the reduction in healthcare-associated infections. Whereas there are many with rinses and some with gels. It takes time to conduct those studies. It takes uh, power, f power of the study. It takes a lot of things. It takes a change in the behavior first and making sure you can monitor everything. But that's why we are still recommending most of the time either the rinses or the gels and be careful that the more a gel will be jelly, the more it is sometimes complicated to have uh, the same efficiency or efficacy than uh, a rinse. That's what I would say. Thank you, Prof. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Prof Didi, I mm. just wanted to ask a question on environmental cleaning. So, you know, most of the guidelines that we have now, it's very complicated. And our environmental cleaners are, you know, uh, usually come from lower social economy. Um, you know, in, in Malaysia, lots of them actually come from Indonesia. And there's always going to be a language barrier. So, in, do you know of any settings where you know, if you were to give an advice, how do we go about, um, uh, you know, telling them what is the best or what is the most important thing they need to concentrate on? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's clear that uh, within the Clean Hospitals project, we are developing what is called a transposable model. So in Geneva, we, the, the hand hygiene promotion model is very well known, but we also have a uh, healthcare and mental hygiene model that we sort of uh, are now modifying according to the new items in the literature and the feedback that we receive from different hospitals. We already are like asking questions and developing this model if possible. So uh, I would say that the advice is, I don't know if my hospital is an example, but what we do, we have a training program for the housekeeping personnel. The training program is given in the own language of the personnel. We have mostly uh, five different languages uh, in our country that are the most used. Um, of course, we cannot teach everyone in his own language, but we, that we try. So I would say, and we have very simplified tools because we want to make sure that simple things are apply. For example, uh, the quantity of the product and how to mix the product. Uh, you know, you and I would say, well, 9 to 1. Uh, 9 to 1 would be easy and uh, understandable. Now, it's not something that you can do. You need to really tell people and, and show people the mark of how much volume versus how much, what order you, 
add this first, then you mix, and then so on. So these are the tools that we all try to develop to make it as simple as possible and as, as right as possible. There are many mistakes that, are, that have been made uh, in many instances, uh, even mistakes that you don't imagine could happen. So a uh, mixture of product, uh, uh, all, the, all these things are, are absolutely key. I don't think there is a magic bullet. I think that every hospital may adapt the, 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 the teaching or the process how to prepare the best product and how to apply this product to this situation. And of course, you should prevent of having too many products because when you have too many products, yeah, there, are, there are a mixture of products that is frequently made and it's uh, inappropriate. So all of these is something that we try to develop and um, that we'll try to, to share. And uh, we will, we will, uh, we are currently working with some hospitals. We'll use more hospitals in, in our survey. Uh, the health agents, the uh, healthcare environmental survey is actually in the validation phase. That's the third validation phase that we will start soon. So you may even be involved in it. And, uh, and so that we are sure that this tool would be usable everywhere. And of course, then, you will have to derive the tools in every, in every hospital. Um, thank you very much, thank uh, you. Prof. Um, Didier. It was really very interesting talk. And, and I think for me, it's just so clear, so logical that we move towards this project of uh, clean hospitals. And we've got the tools, we've got the people. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I, I am offering ourselves to be a uh, part of the project when you start doing the validation and uh, also uh, when you start looking at the self-assessment framework. So we're very happy to take part in this. And you know, even before starting to take part, I think we should now start looking at what we have and uh, looking at how we can implement, implement this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Pite. Uh, we'd like to invite you to take your seat. Um, a big round of applause to Prof. Pite for the lovely talks and thank you everyone for the questions. We have had such a fruitful and informative afternoon thus far. Before we end, I would like to invite Professor Dato, Dr. Adiba Kamarul Zaman, Infectious Diseases Physician, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya and Director of the Centre of Excellence for Research in AIDS, Cheria, to deliver her speech. A warm welcome for Prof. Adiba. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, I hope all of you are in the audience, both here in the auditorium as well as those who are watching on um, YouTube, realize what a privilege it has been this afternoon to have Professor Pite here with us to share his scientific knowledge and passion with all of us to. Uh, reduce the number of hospital acquired infections and, and the, the impact it has had on patients worldwide. I first met Professor Pite, I think it was in, I'm, I'm trying to think, I think it was in 1999 when I went to an infection control course in this beautiful uh, monastery outside Geneva. It was, yeah, it was, it was. Uh, it was held by ECMIT, part of an ECMIT um, European Infectious Disease Society, and it was a five-day course in, in Geneva and to learn about um, infection control. I had just come back, sort of just come back from Australia, and infection control hadn't really been emphasized then, and I thought I, you know, I was the infectious disease physician, infection control person. Oh, I thought I was. I wasn't really the infection control. There was someone else doing it, but I wanted to learn. And at the time, I think the, the hand rub, um, as, as you, you chronicle, was just uh, coming into, into being, in your, 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 the evidence that you were accumulating, etc., etc. And I can tell you, Professor Pite looks exactly like he did back in 1997. He hasn't aged a single 
um, hair, and maybe the hair has changed, but, but the passion, the passion has continued, and we were all talking about, the, you know, the sustainability, the, the fatigue, um, the campaign fatigue that all of us um, go through, the burnout, but I didn't detect a single ounce of it in Professor Pitay. It's exactly as when I was this, this student of his um, many, many years ago. Now, as I was listening to, to Prof and you know, the, the burden of disease as well as mortality from hospital acquired infections and how much Prof has done to not just Switzerland but you know, through WHO, through to all those those countries in Africa, Bangladesh that, that you've seen. I'm wondering why this man hasn't got a Nobel Prize, right? And yet, you know, someone, I'm, I'm sure people are already thinking about those people who designed the mRNA uh, vaccines, you know, who is going to get the Nobel Prize? There are so many who are going to claim there's going to be another fight like the HIV discovery over the mRNA vaccine. So I'm telling you this by way of how important this subject is, and it's a shame that we don't have more clinical doctor leaders in the room. We've got plenty of nurses, and, and give you all a, a big uh, round of applause for the nurses who, who are here today. But the, going back to my experience and, and how I, I I wish, in a way, I had stayed on in infection control, but pivoted to, to, to HIV instead because of the rising numbers of HIV. But, but also, I think what we have today, thankfully, is leadership from Prof Nazira and, and, uh, and, and the team, so much so that we've won the Excellence Award. But after I came back from Switzerland, I could barely get people interested in infection control, and I virtually eventually got tired of it and moved into HIV instead, truth be known. But so we, we are really lucky today that we have hospital administration as well as a champion, Prof Sashila and her team to take this forward. And I'm really pleased to hear that Prof Nazira has taken on that challenge to have the Clean Hospitals <laughs> campaign. So. It gets really personal for me. I'm telling you all these personal stories because all of you heard when we had another event not that long ago that, you know, and, and the question I asked about COVID-19 is, is because our nature is, of course, thy protect thyself first, right? But I think in order to change the culture in this hospital and, and hospitals all around Malaysia is die protect themselves and die protect the patients. We've got to give more emphasis on the need to protect our patients because that patient could be your husband, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. We, we're all very selfish. Right? Unless it's connected to us, we place less importance. And I'm telling you this because, as I have shared with many of you in, in, in another forum, my own husband who fell off his bike and had bilateral subdural survived the subdural very well thanks to our neurosurgeons here but almost had to have an extended stay in hospital because he had a Lyme infection now that's to my own spouse with me looking over your, 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 your shoulders but it's, it's unacceptable isn't it and, and it could have gotten worse if not for me picking up the redness around the area I mean you know like other spouse who may not be so aware may have left the, the, the drip in, may have not bothered about it, and this is what then becomes Staph aureus bacteremia, which then becomes Staph aureus septicemia, which then becomes that little nidus sitting on the aortic valve or the, or the thoracic, um, you know, thoracic aorta or, or whatever, and, and we see this time and time again. So, so I'm making it personal, but I'm, I'm, I'm also making a plea to all of you that, you know, we have, we've all become so aware of the need for clean hands, even, to be fair, even before COVID, but, but it has hopefully become second nature with 
COVID because it was thy protect thyself more than anything. But now it should be that thy protect ourselves and all our patients, right? Um, and so it, it, it is a plea and, and uh, I wish that our doctor leaders are also here in the room and I hope some are listening on, on YouTube because unfortunately, Didier, the, the culture here is still very much, you know, uh, the doctor-nurse gap is still pre ever present and a, a, a call to, to, to arms for the nurses that don't be afraid of ticking off that doctor, that nurse, I mean, that, that doctor, that, that consultant, if they do not wash their hands. And I hope from Nazira, if, if the nurses do that and they get a scolding from the, from the consultants that you will protect um, those nurses. Because unfortunately, that's the culture that the nurses feel because they, they know these things. They, that's why we won the award. It's for, because of the nurses, really, <laughs> and, and Sashila, really, but, um, and her team. But there is still that hierarchical um, culture that's very hard to break through. So all you fantastic nurses, you can, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer too much on the wards, but, you know, feel free to, to, to say so when, when they do wrong, just like you did in, in COVID when they're not doffing and on and off correctly. You, you were able to tell the doctors that they're not doing it correctly, right? So now feel free to tell them that, guys, you forgot to, and girls, you forgot to wash your hands. So take this afternoon as the beginning for 2020, because it's really been bothering me, the, 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 the incidents, particularly of staph bacteremia in this hospital, not just from my own personal terrible experience with my own spouse, but also when, 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 when I'm covering referrals and stuff, it is high, right? We, we, it's something that we cannot be proud of. So, and that is so preventable. So take January 12, 2023, 2023, that we are going to improve on our, well, we, we're already there with hand hygiene, but we must continue to, to sustain it. Sometimes you win awards and then you, you, you kind of um, become complacent. So keep up that hand hygiene um, leadership, but work on, the, on clean hospitals, but also make it a year that we really, really will not tolerate hospital acquired infections anymore. So, Thank you very much for having Prof. Pite sort of kickstart this. You, we cannot get a better, uh, 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 an icon of uh, hospital acquired infections to get us to have a New Year resolution for UMMC to have zero hospital acquired infections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Adiba. With that, we have come to the end of our program. On behalf of the Infection Control and Infectious Diseases Team of University Malay Medical Centre, we would like to extend a big thank you to Professor Pite, our honourable guests and all the participants of today's event. We would also like to thank the team at Saraya for the support rendered in making this event a success, as well as the B. Braun team for all the assistance during the HHEA application and the whole process. Together, let us all strive towards zero hospital-acquired infections through clean hands and clean hospitals. Before we leave, please remain seated for our photography session. Uh, we'd like to request um, our, our guests to fill in the gaps in the middle. so that we can include everyone in the picture.